Yo has struck me as a man, through his career, who's always had an interest in structures. Um, of course, he's uh, of a very, very scientific nature, um, completely different from me. Um, uh, he likes numbers, he likes exact science, and he knows so much about it, I know nothing about it. But I also believe that his interest in structures and restructuring is intimately linked to our common heritage. We are both from a region where an economic monoculture led to the highest levels of wealth the Netherlands has ever known. The city I live in was, at the time, until the 90, end of the 1960s, early 1970s, one of the richest cities in the Netherlands. With the disappearance, this is Heerlen for those of you who don't know, with the disappearance of an economic monoculture, even in one of the wealthiest nations in Europe and on Earth, the impact on that society was so profound that I think by now it's um, almost 50 years since the last mine was closed. The effects of that disappearing monoculture are still felt today in society, in culture, in the attitude people have towards their own community and the outside world. This industrial revolution will leave no stone unturned. We'll leave not one single human being on this planet untouched. We'll disrupt, we'll change, we'll reform everything we know from our production models, from our societal models, from our international models. And it happens with lightning speed all over the world at the same time, which has never been the case before in earlier industrial revolutions. And as with any industrial revolution, it is paired, it is accompanied by fundamental disruption in institutions and systems and politics as well. And I think we are in the midst of this uh, in the world, and especially in the Western world. Our institutions are being challenged. Our institutions are being questioned. Um, our institutions need to reform. Um, but our society needs to reform. Uh, the book mentions some of these elements. How do we look at labour in a society that will use robots increasingly for almost all traditional production uh, systems. What does that mean for labor? <coughs> How do we look at labor when we know that you can only be productive for, uh, in, a, in a lifetime if you adapt during that lifetime at least five, six times to new technologies, new developments? How do we look at labor if productivity is no longer measured only in hours worked and production delivered. Just one element. How do we deal with artificial intelligence? This time of change, fundamental change, this fourth industrial revolution, comes at the end of some of the most serious crises Europe has faced in a century. Financial crisis, economic crisis, migration crisis, and this has caused a lot of uncertainty in society. There is no way we could avoid a discussion about something like a basic universal income. Or something like uh, social protection that would allow people to step out of a job to retrain for something else without losing a, a large part of, of, of their financial security. And this could only be organized um, publicly. This is not something you can only leave to uh, economic actors. Which means that the idea that in, when society develops you can get rid of governance because society will organize itself, I think is being questioned again today in a fundamental way. Then the question becomes, at what level will you need that um, governance? But the only way we can influence global governments to take into account our fundamental values as Europeans is if we speak with one voice as Europeans. 
I think this will be one of the harshest lessons the United Kingdom will learn in the next couple of years that the rest of the world is not that interested in what the UK has to say if it says it outside of the European Union. There is no, in, in times of optimism, having to depend on your neighbour, knowing that your destiny is linked to hers or his, in times of optimism, that's exciting, nice, get together and... In times of pessimism, when you think that all that can happen to you is that you lose something, something is taken from you, depending on your neighbour is a scary thought. And this is where Europe is today. If you look back at the elections over the last year, I had always assumed as soon as people see that what happens in Germany or what happens in France or what happens in the Netherlands has an impact on me in my personal life, people would immediately say, therefore we need to be European. Probably that might have happened in more optimistic times. But what I see in Europe very often is that people follow, nobody's followed the Dutch election uh, eight months ago in the rest of Europe as intensely as this time around because they knew it could have, Wilders won, it could have had an effect on them and on other elections. So you see that what happens in Germany now, for instance, can have an effect on Europe and on us as a whole. But we don't have a vote in Germany. Others don't have a vote in the Netherlands. So something is happening there, and in a democracy, normally something that affects me, I should have a vote about that, but here I don't have a vote. And how do, as Europeans, how do we overcome that? I think by pooling democracy just as well as we pool our economy. At some point, we will have to do that and find solutions for that. So that people learn to trust each other again. Look, the, this treaty was the first response of Europe to the end of the European divide. That's Maastricht, whatever you think of the treaty, it has many flaws, but was an, it was an honest attempt of those Europeans who were already free to answer the challenge of Europe that was no longer divided. With all the flaws it has, it was an honest attempt. We see now that this has led to unprecedented success. I mean, the enlargement of the European Union, which happened in 2004, is without any doubt the biggest success of European integration. For me, there's no doubt. It has led to transformation in Central and Eastern Europe that I, myself, having worked there all these years, would not have deemed possible in that speed, at that level. So you cannot use the law against democracy and human rights, but you cannot use democracy against the rule of law, either. This is what we have learnt in very painful European history. And if we forget that lesson, we will be doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. And this is, for me, very important. What distinguishes us today from Russia is that we are based on the rule of law and they are based on the rule by law, which is a fundamental difference. And I believe that our model is only sustainable if the rule of law is maintained and I feel very much supported by the analysis given in this book. Thank you very much for being here.